In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, one God. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Queen of the Militia, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, one God. Amen. Temptations, as the author says well, are the raw material of glory in the spiritual life. Are the raw material of glory in the spiritual life. St. James admonishes us, My brethren, count it all joy when you shall fall into diverse temptations. This is hard to bear, and we'll explore the reason why we should be happy to be tempted. But the first question is, where do temptations come from? Temptations arise from our, ourselves, either from senses unrestrained, most of the time, of course, as Christ said, the eye, which is the window of the soul, and or um, the passions untamed. It also can come from outside of ourselves. Just the possession or the offer of riches, honors, any form of attachment we make to anything that includes people, distractions, which would be um, when we are at our duty and then we let our minds wander away from our duty, and of course demonic attacks. A demonic attack is best understood for our purposes right now as talking about an interior attack. An interior attack is when a demon, who while he's not able to see the content of your soul, they are able to see, in a sense, what um, not only all the agitation of your outside uh, being, they're also able to kind of see the de a, a somewhat a degree of like the pleasure which God may have in you or not have in you. Whether this is because they enjoy a sight that allows them to see that, or if they can just detect it because um, as we great, more, uh, greatly conform to grace, so our outward deportment also becomes greater. This is the candle on a, uh, a, a lamp, right? We don't hide it. That's like the light of grace coming out from us. So they throw evil thoughts at us. They can also manifest themselves and deliberately attack our exterior. But generally that only happens either as a portent to something, for example, sometimes a great saint will be being born, and obviously God has marked this soul with some type of special thing that the demons can sense, and the mother will be like physically assaulted. We see that in the life of St. Therese, for example. So that was just a foreshadowing of a great figure. Um, it can also be that when a demon can't succeed, uh, be successful in touching our soul through evil thoughts, they will be allowed to manifest themselves physically and attack us by injury. They can make themselves appear as things. For example, uh, St. Anthony saw gold, which were de demons, to make us desire things. Uh, women, St. Padre Pio, uh, St. Um, uh, one of the gentlemen I'm relying on, uh, I'm forgetting his name now, but an early uh, St. Anthony the Great and other desert followers were routinely had, were tempted by women showing, demons showing up as nude women to uh, try to entice them to sin. Okay. All temptations are an alliance of what is within us and what is without us. So, generally speaking, when a person's trying to serve God, they don't actually want to make an explicit act of the will against God. 
right? They're tempted to make maybe acts of the will against God. But like, unless you're literally a mystic of the devil, you're not sitting down and like interiorly trying to hate on God. If you are, that's those people do exist, but um, they're not the normal state of man. Now the devil, which while he's not the author of every temptation, he is the main source of all temptation. At least he's the father of temptations. The devil has an unrelenting vigor and knows the signs of how to overcome souls. The only way we're able to combat the devil at all is through grace. If the devil was allowed to freely have play over all of us, he would, um, and he was able to overcome Adam and Eve through subtlety, and they were perfect in their passions, they weren't aggravated or anything. We are much more weak and vulnerable except for the fact that we have grace. So we can make effective combat against the devil through grace. So anything that injures a life of grace, an unrestrained passion, for example, a little bit of vanity, weakens our ability to be effective against temptation. Anything that cultivates the life of grace, humility, sacramentals, use of the frequent use of the sacraments, reverence, those things all um, make effective combat. No matter what, God is with us. Even if we're in a state of mortal sin, we can't separate ourselves from God in the sense that God is watching us. He's always around us, wherever we are, and he allows every temptation. So nothing can be, tempt, no temptation can come to us that God doesn't allow. And he does every, he allows every temptation out of love for us. There are no exceptions. Well, at least that's the author's opinion. I want to state that. Like That's something that Father Faber was saying. And one of the areas that I don't know on that, just to be honest, is obviously God did harden Pharaoh's heart. Um, there are people who are in that reprobate sense with God. But the author's directing a book towards people who are trying to grow in virtue. So we're talking about when a baptized Christian is tempted, it is because God loves them, and, and he's trying to bring good out of it. We only will come to our greatest love of God through struggling with temptations. To suffer temptations is worse than sickness or adversity. That There's a typo of that line. Skip the next one. To uh, not be removed from temptation is oftentimes a great gift of God because that's how we obtain a crown. Now this has to be understood as the inner combat between thoughts, not as I'm going to put myself in deliberate occasions of sin and see if I don't fall. So for example, a well-known 20th century figure by the name of Gandhi used to like to as a act of self-control, um, sleep with a niece or some, some young woman in the nude and not have any relations with her because he felt in his religious or his egoism that this was a way of practicing chastity. That's absurd. All right, that's not our form of asceticism. So we don't um, uh, prove to ourselves we love God by putting ourselves in an occasion to fall and greatly offend God. At the other end of that spectrum, just going with this theme, since I think it's a common one, St. Anthony of the Desert routinely would have demons show up naked and try to seduce him, and he'd be forced to close his eyes and pray. So many great works of art have been done through the centuries depicting these temptations of Anthony. Of, I mean, not just the demons beating him up, which is another story. There's a beautiful one, of course, of him clinging to an altar that he had built in his hermitage. He's just holding onto it with all of his strength and keeping his head down towards the ground as right behind him is just this mass of 
lewdly dressed or non-dressed women at all trying to entice him. So he wouldn't even lift his eyes up to avoid looking at them. Uh, he would just keep his eyes down. That, to endure that temptation, won him a great crown. And we have never forgotten this obscure figure who would have desired to be forgotten. Here we're talking about him, you know, 1,800 years later. So this is what we mean by fighting the good fight. So if we feel oppressed and worn down by something, it's not, we don't have to make the decision to be free of it. There was an elder once who took a demon from another brother and let him habit it and actually kept the demon with him for three years to make the demon suffer and also because the demon made him suffer. He did it just as an exercise of patience. There was another elder who gave up drinking water for 40 days, right? And he used to like to wash out his bowl in water so he could increase his suffering. Don't do the water thing without permission. You might die. In the life of St. Philip Neri, he had a man who suffered from horrible scruples. He thought God was going to condemn him. He'd wake up in these horrible night terrors and sweats. And he kept begging Philip for the permission to pray to God to deliver him from these temptations. And Philip kept saying, no. I pray that you just have the strength to endure them rather than to be delivered, to no longer feel so oppressed by the fear of God, overwhelmed by it. And eventually it took several years, but he won a great crown. So that's something to bear in mind is that in, in, in the forefront of our Christianity is that when we hear we're going to get a big cross and we know that the way to glory is by embracing the cross, we don't always want to be delivered from temptations. This allows us to put into context the science of the saints. Why did certain monks allow themselves to be stuck as novices for their whole life? Why did blessed uh, uh, Johannes Casey write, he was made a priest, he said, you're never allowed to preach, you're never allowed to hear confessions, and don't ever ask for it. They gave him the faculties a year later, but he never asked for it, so he never knew he had them his whole life. How, how did they do, endure these temptations, right? Well, they saw there was greater glory in embracing the cross than there was in giving in, and we'll, we'll go into that in a moment more. All temptations must be met with humility. All right. And just to add to that, if you're ever tempted in the flesh, I mean by a desire for women, this is always a source of humility for the rest of your life. It's important because there were saints who did not experience those temptations at all, and Christ himself, when he was out in the desert, did not endure those temptations. The devil didn't even like waste his time with it. So if you feel them, and I will share with you, you know, I've felt them, Right? It is always a mark of humility to know that this is an area of weakness for us. And that's fine, because when we're weak, God makes us strong. If you endure temptations on every single imaginable appetite, once again, that's not a bad thing. It's actually a mark of, if you want to do the combat with them, it's a mark that God wants to perfect you through them. He did not give that to every saint. St. Teresa of Avila never endured temptations of the flesh. Ever. She actually would send you to somebody else if you needed help on combating those. So she lost that crown. She has many crowns, but she doesn't have that crown. We must be on guard against all delectations. A delectation is taking any joy or delight in a forbidden pleasure. In order to take joy or delight in something, you have to start examining it and trying to find what is good in it. Evil is an absence of good, or it can be a misuse of a good thing. So this is where temptation gets a little bit more complicated. Eating too much is a sin, but we need to eat. And it's okay to thank God and be joyful in what he gives us to eat. It's a good thing. Right? But it's a bad thing if we start taking delectation, the idea of being a glutton about it. Right? So like uh, in the rule of St. Benedict, he speaks about uh, Anne and Cassian. Both of them talk about monks who fast. So they 
And then they dream about their feast day and how they're going to prepare these certain foods and they're going to really pig out. Right? I mean, so that that is, he, he used that example of being a bad monk. Don't, don't do that. And when you think about it, they're taking an object of desire. Their desire should be on God in his feast day. They're turning it over their mind. They're examining it. And then they're looking at how to abuse it. That is a delectation. All right? Now, if you go oh, on feast day, I'll have some comfort. And then you think about it, you're like, oh, yes, I hope I live to the feast day. And then you move on. That's not delectation. All right. We The goal here is to prevent any evil from reaching the heart. All right. Oh, the heart gives consent. The mind just looks at things. And so in Deuteronomy, it says, beware lest perhaps a wicked thought steal in upon thee. The example that it was actually giving is refusing food to somebody who is in need. So we can also experience these temptations to not do good things. For example, it's very bad, and, and it shows you how blind we can be if somebody says something like, I will never do this good work, like martyrdom. It's one thing to say I'm not worthy to be a martyr or I pray that God never puts me to the test. It's another thing to say I couldn't do X. Well, of course you couldn't. Grace is the thing that does it, right? I could never give away everything I have if I had to, right? right? So then we've, we've already found our false God and we're not really spiritual people then. By the way, this is more or less what the whole crisis in the church is with communion right now, being what it is. Is it's, I mean, we're not even letting these people, um, we're letting people basically live an evil life. It's entered their heart. They've been convinced that the evil that they've allowed enter to their heart is good, even though that to actually move towards God would mean renouncing it. It is schizophrenic and mad. It doesn't happen always, but the author does say, and we know for a fact that God sometimes leads the soul to perfection by the way of temptations. That that soul is basically going to get tempted severely. It will be the predominant mark of their life will just be enduring temptations. That is not a sign that you are not traveling the right way in this knighthood. Joining the knighthood and enduring more temptation is not a sign that you're in the wrong place. Just like if you do a good work and you face more temptations, it is not necessarily a sign that the good work is not pleasing to God. In fact, because we obtain crowns of glory by temptation, it can oftentimes be the opposite sign. And how are we going to be perfected unless we get increasingly difficult circumstances in our life. If God wishes to make us travel by the way of temptations, we must take this route with good cheer. So whatever means of salvation God gives us, we have to accept it with good cheer. It's one of the absolute maxims of the spiritual life because basically to not accept it with good cheer is to say, God doesn't love me, he's not a loving father, and he's not guiding me by the way that I, I need to be guided. Now, inversely, of course, if we're walking in the way of sin, we're going to feel gloomy. Of course, if we're not fighting our passions, we're going to feel cast down. This is the predominant thing that exists in Christianity today. People observe some exterior forms of religion, but they don't care anything about fighting their passions doing spiritual reading or exercises, or anything else. Or maybe they do, but only to avoid mortal sin, and don't ask them to do any more than that. They basically still live their life for pleasures, and because their life is dominated by pleasures, they are dead, as St. Paul teaches. She who lives in pleasures is dead. So they feel sad and weighted down by their death that they're carrying around with them. And so then they go... Um, they go further to the world to like get away from that spirit of deadness. So walking in the way of temptation, 
when it's understood that these are combating thoughts, not being around evil people, places, or things, we should be cheerful. Temptations will change as one advances in the spiritual life. The imitation of Christ says that um, sometimes people are heavily tried in the beginning and then later not so much. Sometimes people endure temptations their whole life. Sometimes they're modestly tempted and then all the temptation comes at the end. We see this, all these examples in the lives of the saints. Saint Therese was lightly tempted. She endured horrible temptations at the end of her life. There were other saints that seemed to get confirmed in grace at some point and then not really experience much temptations. This appears to be more like the life of St. Philip Neri, where he seemed to basically, after Pentecost and his heart became enlarged, he was just, I mean, in a way, he was like confirmed at that point. He just, I mean, he endured some things, but it never really impacted him. St. Anthony of the Desert is another example of this. He basically endured horrible temptations in the beginning. It lasted a long time. And then he walked in peace and he didn't even, it said, he literally obtained to the level of perfect love casts out all fear where he basically walked as God's brother. And in a way, he was here, but only to help people until he died, he passed. We don't know either, unless God reveals it to us, which way it's going to be for us. When a soul is good, the devil's main job with temptations are to get us to abandon meritorious actions or make meritorious actions unmeritorious. He wants us distracted at the office, or he wants us doing it lousily. He wants us not making fervent communions or sloppy confessions, or maybe even better, trick us into pride and then sacrilege. He wants us fasting, but he wants us then to break our fast with eating our favorite meal. He wants us being, uh, he takes what is good righteous indignation and he turns it into anger. I love what um, he gave a story here of St. Bernard where he was preaching and then he was tempted to thoughts of vainglory and he talked back to the thought and he said, I did not begin for you and I shall not leave off for you, he said to the devil. He didn't preach for the, he was preaching, he wasn't going to stop preaching just because he felt some temptations to vainglory. So that's important to bear in mind, especially like that old saying about don't let the uh, perfect be the enemy of the good. So much so when we're doing good works. One of my favorite maxims to give people the benefit of the doubt that has served me well, he who does the work gets to make the mistakes. Use that for yourself and give it that to other people. So there are many benefits in resisting temptations. We gain merit. They fill us with disgust for the world because the more intense the temptation is, and since all this is in the create in our life here, um, we just begin to, because we know how hard it is to resist them, we begin to even look for things that like whet our appetite and, and to hate them. Resisted, they increase God's love for us. They expiate the punishment of our past sins. They teach us our own weakness. They humble us. It makes us properly esteem grace. So because temptations are only overcome by grace, we start to begin to understand how grace works in our life. And it, it really is only understood by living it and fighting temptations. We increase watchfulness on ourselves what sets us off, what, what whets our appetite, what, what um, people are good and, and bad for us. It makes us more uh, fervent. And uh, last but certainly not least, it will teach you the great spiritual science. And this is for uh, yourself and for others. Basically, it's one of the reasons why you can't listen to a beginner in the spiritual life, unless it's like Daniel, the prophet, whose wisdom is proved by a miracle when he was 13. And so there are exceptions to that rule, but as a, as a rule of thumb, 
a beginner who um, hasn't really struggled for a long time, has not really learned the science yet of struggle. St. Macarius, uh, the great of the desert, um, he was called the young elder because he obtained a great spiritual knowledge by the time he was in his 30s. But he had already been a priest for seven or eight years. And not only that, he had endured a horrible, horrible trial. Um, and we didn't need to go down his life, but that proved his virtue to everybody. Um, so what mistakes can be made when we're experiencing um, temptations like broadly? Like what are these broad? I don't mean like when you're fighting a particular temptation, but just we're looking at our life and we notice what we're dealing with a lot of temptations. If we believe that the time spent combating temptations is lost time, no, never, never. In fact, we should spend time. Like, what should I pray about? Think about your temptations. Anticipate the difficulties of your day. We'll be slow, eating too much, talking too much. When, who, why? What can I do to fight these sins? If we're passive under temptations, this is a very common problem. It's in it. I think it's a lot in our pop, um, pop spirituality of the day. You have to not just let evil thoughts walk by your mind, right? And the spiritual combat it says, no. You say to God, you let Him know, right? I do not consent to this. As He says, I do not consent in your heart. All right, especially if it's of the flesh, right? You immediately just start rejecting it. Um, you have to confront all the evil thoughts that come in. Even better if you, and there's a good book on this. Uh, Will, I know you have it. Um, I highly recommend it to you. Uh, it's called uh, Talking Back. It's by Evagarius the Solitary. It's published by Cistercian Press. It is the eight deadly sins, which is just pride and vainglory. They separate into two sins, and they have biblical responses to every temptation. And it's more of a source book, so if you feel a temptation, you can go to the scriptures. So, for example, if a person is uh, tempted to um, uh, vengeance, right? Vengeance is mine, say the Lord, right? Or... Uh, tempted to thoughts of uh, vainglory. Um, what am I but dust and ashes? Right? Um, it has those types of biblical responses. But even better if you're able to do it in your own words and show absolute hatred and contempt for them. And it's important that even if it arises out of your appetite, even if you feel it's coming from you, that's coming from your passions, not you. You're, the, you're a son of God. You're a prince of the kingdom. You're a knight that's not coming from you. It's coming from your passions. Your passions can be trampled down and subjugated underneath your will. So it's important that we're never passive to these things. <sighs> Misuse of calms leading to excessive worry during later temptations. So we occasionally, God will like give us some respite and like for a week or a day or something, we don't like have a lot. And I'll tell you what normally happens. You go, have I made it? Have I made it through the tribulation? <laughs> right? It's like great calm. You're like, maybe I've obtained the virtue. Virtue has to be tried, you should say to yourself. Rather, you should bless God for the peace. Right? Get as much of it out of it as you can. And to remember, he can give you peace whenever he wants to. And that's something you can ask for. But... Do not be disturbed when the temptations come back. Do not be disturbed when the temptations come back. They may even come back worse. The only thing, examine yourself if you caused it or if it was from outside of you. And finally, delusion. This delusion is, well, what if I just take the edge off a little bit by giving into the sin? Let me just take the edge off a little bit. I'll just lie a little bit. Just lay around for a little while. Whatever it is, whatever passion we're giving into. And this goes for passions too, not just for sins. 
Now, everything I'm saying here isn't just particular to us as knights. It's literally the spiritual life for everybody, no exceptions. It's just most of the time not talked in detail this much. So he outlines here three things to overcome temptations or endure them. And I didn't, I mean, he talks a lot and he's very 18th century in that he really surrounds, there's a lot of extra language, but basically be cheerful under temptation, pray and examine yourself. I will distill down six pages for you. And then his long, long discussion on the importance of being faithful to little things, which we've already gone over before. All right, so being punctual for your office, saying it carefully, not eating too much, right? Those little things, paying a bill on time. And realizing that this type of faithfulness enables us to be faithful under greater temptations. So that's why I felt the need to supplement it with a new handout for novices. And that's just the, this is not from him. Let us start off by stating the obvious. In order to overcome temptations, you have to start with three rule, with three things. No evil company, places, or things. It's important to note that while Christ did eat with sinners, he didn't do so at a brothel. He went to their house. He was invited. They had already repented or they welcomed him in. We cannot go to or spend time with people who are evil. That means people who love evil. At places or things. It's quite easy to figure this out before we do things if something is evil company. An evil com person in evil company basically either serves the world, the flesh, or the devil and delights in dragging you down with it. Now, do we have to spend time in evil company? Yes. If we're forced to because of our job, for example, performing a civic duty, being entrusted with some task, and we have to see it through. Right? Monks had to go to the marketplace to sell their mats. There was no, they had to deal with it. The marketplaces in the ancient world were awful. Slaves were sold. Prostitutes prostituted themselves. There was dishonest merchants, dishonest thieves. It was a bad place, but they had to be there. And finally, evil things. If a thing is used mainly for evil, it's evil. They have a weird spiritual power about them, like idols, for example. I mean, like real idols. They have an evil power in them. You should try to be avoid them. You should hate those things. It's like this weird modern fixation with like little African idols and stuff like that. Be careful about that stuff. So when we choose to basically go and spend time with evil company in an evil place or have an evil thing, these are unnecessary occasions of sin. We left the army of heaven and we've joined the leagues of hell. It is not possible uh, to fight without respite for the kingdom of heaven and to love evil. The fear of the Lord hateth evil, Proverbs 8.13. So this isn't just a strong dislike, it's a hatred. You should, you should want to have a reaction to it, an adamant hatred, rejection, disdain. Just to develop this idea a little bit more, because we hate evil, we see the reaction that Christ had to it in the gospel, which was driving out the money changers from the temple. Why was God in the temple? He was there to do a duty. That duty was worship. He was the son of God. He was there to worship his father in the temple. He was there to pray. It's his duty. It was his right to. And what are these people doing in a holy place? Something that they're not allowed to do. And so he drove them out. Okay, that's hatred for evil. Okay. Do not let evil touch the heart. Beware lest perhaps a wicked thought steal in upon thee. Whether temptation must be endured exteriorly via the senses 
or comes into the mind from any numerous places, we must not let any evil reach our heart. For example, if you're at mass and there are some parents who are not letting, the, who are not controlling their children, we must not let our exterior agitation caused by the shrieking child that should be taken out cause us that thought to enter into our heart to hate our brother, who are the parents who do not take their children out. So, for example, wanting vengeance against the parents, that would be an evil, right? That would be reaching our heart, or just a judgment upon their character. So, and this, this explains our chapter, do not satisfy the desires of a corrupt nature. Um, anything that arises from the passions has to be resisted. And this is why it's so important to plan out our day, right? For example, it's it's a good thing to measure your food. And I'm not trying to like get you to go home and start using cups of food, but we have a general idea about what satisfies our appetites to get us through the day, for example, right? And so we might be eating something and we really enjoy it and then we go and then the passions come and they say, you should eat more than that. You really enjoy that. Why not a little more? You should say, no, no, I won't. I won't do it just because the passions told me to. And I hate you, and then you should not eat more. That's an example. That's why it's important to have a plan on the way we live our lives. And the more a person progresses in their spiritual life, especially as constant and stable in their routine, the more they can anticipate things. And so by making a plan and obeying, you know, that's one of the reasons why we have the director, right? It's so that we bring our plan to him and we make sure we're, it's uh, in conformity with our state, with our strength, with our current disposition. We must fight without respite. Okay. So here we're going to talk about St. Hezekiah, the priest. He was a, a priest in Jerusalem about 350 A.D. And... Um, he outlines the four things here that, and he calls it the spiritual struggle that we must have at every moment of our lives. Humility, extreme attentiveness, refutation of thoughts and prayer. Humility, extreme attentiveness, refutation of thoughts and prayer. I felt the need to bring this up because there is other schools of thought, but this is probably truly the, the most ancient, consistent, and like you can apply it to every single situation. So St. Hezekiah was the disciple of St. Hilaron the Great. That was the contemporary St. Anthony. St. Hilaron the Great, was writ his life is written by St. Jerome if you're interested in reading it. Um, he was a youth when he was went to the desert to meet St. Anthony the Great. He stayed with him for two months he left with some monks, and then they formed their own monastery back in Palestine. So he was—he learned from him, and this the other gentleman learned from Saint Anthony. Saint Hilaron was known for enduring the worst temptations for years on end in the desert. He is the father of monasticism in, in the Holy Land, in, in Palestine in particular. Here's a quote from St. Jerome. So many were his temptations, so various the snares of the demons night and day, that if I wished to relate them, a volume would not suffice. How often when he would lay down did naked women appear to him? How often sumptuous feasts when he was hungry? So how do we do this? He, and this is just great for us as knights, he describes that we should approach temptations like war. It is necessary to act the same way in spiritual warfare as one acts in conventional war. First of all, attentiveness is required. Secondly, when we notice that the enemy has advanced a thought, it is necessary to strike it with a curse with anger in the heart. All right, you, you should look at it like the way I like to look at bugs that come into my house that I kill. I'm not into the whole, oh, I'm going to go shoo the spider outside. No, this is my house. You don't belong here. Get out. The same way you would react, 
view yourself like a church. And imagine the indignation you would feel if, for example, a naked woman walked into your church. That's not you necessarily. That could be the devil sending that thought. You with anger would rise out and shove that woman outside the church. And you'd be, you'd be furious that somebody would dare walk into church that way. And so that's the way we want to approach evil thoughts, with anger. Thirdly, one must pray against it, calling Jesus Christ into the heart so that the demonic apparition will vanish and the mind will not go off daydreaming like a child fascinated with some adept or conjurer. So we have to then be a, um, so attentiveness, right? That means we don't allow our mind to go unwatched. And just a good way to reason this out is just try to start making the habit of not making decisions on impulse. Like that's a place to start. If you're, wow, this is crushing and overwhelming. If you feel that way, just go, okay, until I have had time to think about things, I won't make any decisions on impulse. By the way, holy habits like knowing how much we should uh, pray or, or eat or something or how much we need to sleep, those aren't made on impulses. Those are long-standing habits. If we want to change them, it should be done gen gently, but with thought, not on an impulse. Okay. We also have to be keep very close walk over what we allow ourselves to think about. Oftentimes, we go through our lives day after day, getting wound up in vain thoughts, injurious thoughts, angry thoughts, just that's back to uh, earlier lesson. I call that being sifted, Satan sifting you like wheat, right? We break all of our thoughts onto Christ. We want to strike at the evil thoughts. We must, as the spiritual mantras teach us, show contempt and hatred for all of our wicked passions and or to the devil. It is not enough to avoid evil thoughts. We must hate them, show contempt for them, and talk back to them. All right, that's why I recommend that book, Talking Back. Okay, Psalm 97.10 says, You that love the Lord hate evil. The Lord preserveth the souls of the saints. He will deliver them out of the hand of the sinner. All right, so... The hatred of evil allows God to then preserve us in the conflict against evil. Finally, praying against it. We must then realize when we are tempted to pray against it, that is, to let the evil touch our heart. All right? When um, St. Al, just to show you how, uh, once again, this is just normal spiritual life. St. Alphonsus in his elder years said that if he could only preach on one topic again, it would be to pray when tempted. We should call on the name of salvation to defeat the temptation. So all of our prayers go to the Father through Christ, our Lord. Whether you call on a saint, whether you call on um, anybody, more or less, they're all going to Christ to um, petition the Father on your behalf. Right? So that's what I mean. That's what they mean. Of course, you can call on your guardian angel a virgin martyr, the holy souls, what, whoever you feel drawn or inclined to, or you can just start saying the name of Jesus, which means salvation, right? And the goal with this prayer is that you not consent to any sin. The goal is that you do not consent to any sin, right? So we watch our thoughts, we show hatred for bad thoughts and we call upon God in some way. Okay. So just um, to reiterate here, if we resist temptation successfully in this life, we will be saved. But be watchful after this temptation. Not that you fall into tons of gross sins of dishonesty or impurity or um, covetousness or something like that. Watch that you do enough good. Watch that you do enough good. That's where the devil tries to assault knights. 
They either try to get to do good that's not our job, do our good badly, not do enough good, give up the struggle from time to time, go on spiritual vacation. Be watchful of that. But we're never secure. We're not, the kingdom of heaven is not a defensive position. It is a offensive position, right? The prince of this world has been judge and Christ is Lord and sovereign, but he wants us to fight for him. Like we're not waiting around. Right? Whether that means that we're constantly engaged in the duty of prayer or of penance or of corporal works of mercy or spiritual works of mercy, we are always fighting without respite. Now you understand what it means, right, in the, the prologue to the rule, right, to fight without respite for God and his rights. It is speaking of that great spiritual conflict which is always there no matter what exterior persecution, war, or other thing is going on. Are there any questions? Finally, when you are overcome by temptations at the end of the chapter and as every other spiritual master also, when you lose and you commit a sin, when you fall, what do they say? Well, get up again. And that's, that's what the Desert Fathers taught every great master in the spiritual life from the time of Christ our Lord, right, or John the Baptist, really, the forerunner, or Elijah, or any of the preachers of penance, right? Oh, you sinned? Repent. Stop sitting. Get back on with it. If you fall, just wipe it off and get back to the fight again. The saints, once they really hit the ground running, they stop being discouraged by their sins. They stop being discouraged by their sins. They realize it was gonna happen and they were gonna fight harder, but they stop being discouraged at a point. So, don't be discouraged when you fall. Just get up, keep struggling. Okay. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. So our next class will be on... Do we have Latin next week? I don't know either. <laughs> I don't know when our next class is going to be. It might be next. No one's traveling for 4th of July, right? No? Okay. Well, it might be. We're doing Latin while we're doing this class. I'll let you know as soon as I know. So, all right. I'm planning to uh, hopefully get out another uh, document for um, the preparation on vows. I did put up the first document. It's on our website under Novice Formation, and the audio recording is on our Podbean if you want to listen to it. Thank you and God bless.